I am little bird and one day I will fly. However, this will not be that day. The closest I have come to flying is practically tumbling down the steep sides of the crags with Will. How do I look, little bird? My best friend asks me now, when we finally stumble and skip towards the back of the milling crowd at the harbour. The very sound of them stirs the heart. Folk clap and stamp along as George, the island's youngest and finest player, plays a traditional rousing air to welcome the docking ship. You look fine, I turn and answer my friend, and begin straightening his cap and plucking sprigs of heather from the good jumper that Mrs Beaton just knitted for him. But keep your arm across the front so your mother doesn't see the hole there. I don't ask Will how I look because I know that I must seem like some savage child that has been living wild on the moor. Will has no idea why I'm laughing but joins in anyway, all the while returning the favour and brushing away grasses and twigs and blossom that has stuck to me. But we both stop laughing when we see Effie's furious face. My middle sister might be talked of as pretty, but her prettiness is all too often disguised by all the scowling she does. She's like one of the cattle of a summer's evening when the midges are biting and maddening them. Now a smile slips unbidden onto my face as I imagine fiery-haired Effie as a shaggy red highland cow. It's not wise to do that, of course. Effie, in her best skirt and her new-made checkered plaid shawl, steps straight away from her friends and comes over to berate me. What humours you so bridey? Does it amuse you that you are to shame father today? Where have you been? Why did you not go home and change into your good clothes? Her words come fast as they often do, allowing me no time to answer. Not that I have an answer that will suit her. The fact of it is, I never have an answer for either of my bossy sisters. Yes, but it is the fault of the visitors for coming too early, says Will, trying to protect me. You see, little bird... Oh, for heaven's sake! Her name is Bridie Will Beaton, snaps Effie. How many times have you been told over the years? Ah, uh, but since we were both young children, Will has always mimicked Mr Menzies in calling me little bird in English. Even mother, who's held on to her Gallic language like a treasure, would smile fondly when she heard Will call me so. Perhaps it amused her to hear such unnatural English words spring forth from the mouth of an islander child. But it is not just the English of my pet name that Effie dislikes. It is the fact that both Effie and Ishbel rail against this pet name itself. They worry that people hearing it will think of me as small and to be pitied. But I don't think folk do pity me. And anyway, I don't care if they do. I was born into this body and I know no other. And if I can manage what everyone else can, even if it is sometimes a little slower, then what of it? And the mess of your hair! Effie turns back to me and sighs. When Ishbel sees this, she will give me such trouble for not making sure that you were decent. To think of Effie getting a scolding from her eldest sister causes another smile to slip onto my face. At 17, Ishbel is only two years Effie's senior, but being a maidservant for the Laird gives her airs and graces indeed. What is this? At those words, my straggly long black hair is near pulled clean from my head. Ishbel is not one for nagging chatter like hot-headed Effie. Her scorn is shown by a disapproving and quiet coolness. Effie, could you not have tied a simple braid for Bridie? I hear Ishbel address her sister sharply, and straight away I feel her tug at my grass-matted hair into something less like a broom that's been sweeping leaves from the floor. Ow! I yelp as the tugging cricks at my neck. Be still, Bridie, or I'll... Ah, but Ishbel's warning is lost as the cheers go up. I don't care whether my hair is tidy or raggedy. Feeling her grip relax a bit, I seize my opportunity and pull away from Ishbel's hold, running from both her and Effie and their glowering. Hurrying forward, I sneak through the crowd, sure that Will cannot be far behind, so that I might see these grand folk from London at last. And there they are. Two men in long, thick coats and similarly patterned checkered trousers, with grey top hats and silver-tipped canes. Unlike the bearded men of Tornish, they wear just moustaches, but quite twirled at each end. They stride confidently off the steamer's ramp to shake hands with the laird and make some small talk. They also nod at the musicians, summon kilts. Well, you two, says a warm voice beside me. What do you think to our visitors? I have found myself by Mistress Beaton. 
She takes care of the old Laird's washing, drying his bed linen and clothing on lines by the seashore, so that the big house must always be filled with the fresh, salty spice of the ocean. I think you look very smart, I say, my heart surging with excitement of having strangers from the outside world touch down on our shores. At the same time, I am straining to watch the gentlemen turn their attention back towards the boat, holding their hands so that ladies, oh, the fine ladies, may descend safely from the ramp and onto dry land. The first two to step ashore wear bright coloured dresses that puff out so, with many layers of fine cotton petticoats underneath their braid-edged skirts. It gives me pleasure to see that one is quite young, perhaps the same age as Effie. I wonder, might I sometime be able to approach and talk to her during her visit? I would so like to hear what it is like to travel the whole length of the country in a steam train. What a strange affair that must be. My, she must have seen such things in her life. The sights and sounds of London and of Glasgow too, where the train terminated. And on that journey alone, what wonders of towns and villages and valleys and hills did she see? Oh, I know that in many places it might not be natural for a young lady of her kind to converse with a girl of my type, but the Laird is not a man to stand on ceremony. I'm already a favourite of Mr Menzies, and so perhaps he might think to introduce me to her. What is this about? I hear Will mutter in confusion and switch my glance to a lady who now follows in such a strange guise. After a moment's surprise, I guess it to be full black mourning, from dress to cape, from gloves to a lace veil. I have heard that this is done, but I've never seen such a thing. This woman, a widowed grandmother perhaps, reminds me of the crows that make the thick woods behind the big house their shaded home. And aiding her as a maid servant, holding her elbow. Though it does seem to me the maid has been a little rough with the old lady. I'm staring so hard at this odd pairing that it takes me a moment to see that I'm also being stared at. The younger of the ladies in layers and lace is casting her eyes over me in a way that makes me see quite clear how I am to her. A peasant girl in torn and tatty clothes. A child with a bent foot and one arm weak and withered. She sees all that is me and she sees no one of worth. The warmth of the day leaves me as a brisk wind lifts off the sea and bites to my core.